I love my lathe. Not only is it a delightfully manual machine, it's also packed with functionality that make it a joy to use. But there are some things on it that could have simply been done better. This lathe has a quick change tool post, which, as the name suggests, makes changing tools super fast. Changing the angle of the tool post, however, is not so quick. The nut that locks the tool post angle requires a separate wrench just to loosen and tighten, which is a serious pain in my work boots. Okay, maybe I'm being a little bit extreme, but when I see how easily I could fix this, I can't help but be picky. So let's make a better tool post nut. This will be a pretty straightforward project, but before I begin, let's outline some of my requirements. First, and most obviously, the replacement nut should not require any tools to operate. That means it's going to have to include an integrated handle. Amongst my grandfather's tooling, he had a second, smaller, quick change tool post with an identical handle to the one already on the lathe. I feel like it'd be pretty silly not to use this. This leads me to my next requirement. The replacement nut needs to look original to the machine. Will this add any functional improvement to the part? No but I can make it match, so I will. I'm gonna to try to replicate the style and finish of the tool change lever already here. If I had to guess, this is a bare alloy steel that's been shot blasted to produce a textured finish. So I'll get some 4140 on order, which should do the job nicely. Before diving into the design, there are a few critical measurements I'll need to make as well. First are the specs on the threads. This lathe was made in China, so I'm expecting everything to be metric. And sure enough, the tool post is measuring out to be an M22 thread. My pitch gauges aren't quite coarse enough for this thread, but a little guesstimating with some calipers tells me this is a 2mm pitch. I don't have a tap this size, so I'll have to single point turn these on the lathe. The other thread to consider are the ones on the end of the handle. These are an M14 by 2mm thread. I don't have this tap either, but there's also no way that the thread cutter will fit in a bore that small. So I'll add that tap to my shopping list as well. While I wait for my supplies to arrive, I'll get a few more measurements and then I can start mocking this up on paper. This will let me make sure that the final result isn't going to look silly or have any interferences. Like here, if I set the new handle at the same angle as the original, I'll end up busting my knuckles whenever I move the levers. That's no bueno. So I'll have to increase the angle of the new lever to give a little more clearance. That should do the trick. Overall, I think this looks pretty good. Now for the detailed drawing. To start, I'll draw out the border and the title block. Although I already have some paper that has these on it, it seems silly to use these when it has another manufacturer's name on it. Drawing this out myself lets me keep it simpler and also add my own branding. Gotta represent, you know what I mean? From here I can start laying out my views using my mock-up as a reference. This is a pretty straightforward design, so a side and top view should suffice. The side view will define the profile I'll need to turn on the lathe, then the top view will depict the threaded through hole. Actually, I'll also need a section view to adequately detail the angled hole for the handle. This view will be at a 2 to 1 scale, so the details will be easier to see and to mention. And as customary for a section view, I'll include cross hatching to represent where solid material was sliced. Tasks like this are where the drafting machine really shines. It makes drawing this multitude of parallel lines so much faster. As I'm thinking about the design a little more, there's one more feature I'll add just in case. The handle I'll be using isn't as long as the big wrench I normally use on the nut, meaning I won't be able to get the same kind of tightening torque. So I'll include a set of wrench flats just in case I really need to crank down on the tool post for those occasional heavy operations. The last step is to lay out all the dimension lines and drop in the values. Now we're ready to start machining. Well, sort of. The tap I ordered came in, but the 4140 steel? Well, I just found out it was delayed. Twice. That's not going to work. At this point, I have no choice but to use some of the plain carbon steel already in my stash. I'll start with the lathe operations. Oh, and I'll probably need to put the tool post back on here. There we go. The face, of course, is nowhere near true, so I'll start the usual way by cleaning this up first. The diameter of the steel is already at my desired major dimension, but as you can see, it's all rusty. Since most of the dimensions are made up for aesthetics anyway, I'll give a little here and just skim the outside about 15 thou to clean this up. 
Before I spend any more time on the outer tapered features, I'll knock out the more complicated stuff first, beginning with the 22mm threaded bore. The starting hole for these threads needs to be 20mm, but as you may be realizing, there isn't much metric tooling in this shop, so I have to resort to drilling with the next smallest English drill size, a 25 32nd. I'm drilling about half an inch further than I need to just to give myself some runout room when I start cutting threads. The drill still leaves about 6 thou on the ID, so I'll switch to a boring bar and remove the rest of the material. Which of course requires playing my favorite game, musical tool holders. I really need to move making more tool holders up in priority on my project list. A helpful trick I've learned for setting the tool height is to spin the tool post around and use the point of a tailstock center as a reference. From my experience, boring bars cut a little better when set just a bit above centerline. Now I can flip this around, get a touch on the ID, and remove the remaining material. Checking with the telescoping bore gauge and a micrometer looks like I'm just a hair large, but that will do. With the boring bar still mounted, I'm going to cut a little relief for the thread cutting tool at the back of this hole. Neither you or I can really see what's happening, but I'm basically just making the ID larger in the last half inch of this hole. Well, that wasn't what I meant to do. I got a little excitable and pulled the boring bar out without clearing the material. So now the threaded area is toast. I just love starting over. On the bright side, I have all my tooling sorted out, so I should be able to get back to the same point rather quickly. With that little mishap out of the way, I can set up for the actual threading. I'll swap another tool holder for the internal thread cutting tool, and this time set the height exactly on center using the tailstock as a reference like before. Because of which side the boring bar this cutting tool is on, I'll have to make my cuts feeding into the bore. I actually received a helpful tip from a commenter a while back for scenarios like this. They recommended setting the compound angle at a 60 degree angle such that I'm pulling into the material in the same direction that the carriage moves. So in my case towards the southwest direction. This ensures that the cutting forces are always pushing the tool against the correct side of the backlash and the compound lead screw. One last step is to square up the tool post with the spindle. Using the side of the tailstock quill makes this super easy. Now to set the feed rate. I need a 2mm pitch and it looks like I can achieve this just by changing a couple of the levers. Actually, I'm just now realizing I've never cut metric threads on this lathe. This only became apparent once I looked at the thread dial. It tells me which marks to engage on depending on the thread pitch, but only for inch threads. I think what I'll have to do here is just pick one and only engage the feed on that exact mark. One last thing before making any cuts is to set the tool position. First I'll eyeball the end of the stock with the center point of the cutter, and then zero the z-axis on the DRO. Then with the lathe running, bring the tool out very slowly until I just get a touch on the inner bore. I'll zero the x-axis on the DRO, zero the dial on the crossfeed handwheel, and also zero the dial on the compound handwheel. Now, after all that setup, we can finally cut the threads. There are a lot of steps here, but my normal process goes something like this. Set the compound to cut a few thousandths. Engage the thread feed on the mark we defined on the thread dial. Once the cut clears the backside and the bore, disengage the feed. Move the cross feed out a bit and then wheel the carriage out of the bore. Reset the cross feed to zero. Set the compound a few more thousandths deeper and re-engage the thread feed. Then just repeat. But after just a few cuts, it's apparent my normal process isn't working here. My cutter isn't landing in the same groove on each pass. It actually looks like it's cutting two different pitches, which means this part is also now scrap. Dear machine shop gods, I was being sarcastic when I said I love starting over. Before moving on, I should really figure out what went wrong here. The manual for this lathe isn't the most detailed, so I wasn't surprised at all when nothing about cutting metric threads was mentioned. I think the problem is that the thread dial doesn't really define engagement points for metric threads. I could probably spend some time figuring out what those actually are, but instead I have a faster workaround. Gluing the stock to see what's actually going on, I'll take some passes with an external threading tool. Rather than disengage the feed at the end of my pass, I'll just stop the lathe. Then run the lathe in reverse to back the tool off the part for the next pass, leaving the feed engaged the entire time. Checking the pitch with the scale looks like I'm bang on 2 millimeters. With that figured out, let's start over for what is hopefully the last time. This go around I'll have to use a larger stock to start with, since that's all I have. I'm also going to drill and bore a lot deeper of a relief to give myself some more room to start and stop the lathe. I really, really don't want to crash the tool into the bottom of this hole. With the threading tool remounted and located, I'll engage the feed for the one and only time on this operation and begin very carefully taking passes. Something about this is even more nerve-wracking than regular thread cutting. 
I suppose there's the risk of the lathe not stopping in time, although the motor VFD is on a consistent ramp speed. Some testing beforehand showed me that the stopping distance is about a quarter inch, and I have much more than that at the bottom of this hole. But this still has me on pins and needles. I'm getting kind of close, so I'll need something to test the fit with. It just so happens that I have another tool post with an M22 by 2 thread, so this should be a good reference. Well, I'm glad I stopped and checked. This goes right in. If anything, it's just slightly on the loose side, but will work fine. I'll take that as a sign the machine shop guards are looking down after me and are doing their best not to let me make any more mistakes. The edge of the hole is still a little gnarly, so I'll change tools and put a little chamfer on here. Now we can move on to cutting the tapered profile. The taper is 15 degrees, so I'll set up the compound to do this. The scale on the compound is good enough for this purely aesthetic feature, but I want to try my hand at a little trick I saw recently for setting the angle more accurately. With the compound somewhat close to 15 degrees, I can set up a dial indicator against a tailstock quill. The idea is as I move the compound out a specific amount, it will result in a change on the dial indicator. And I can figure out what that change is with a little trigonometry. So for instance, if I move the compound 0.5 inches, a 15 degree angle should result in a change on the dial indicator of 0.129. Then I can simulate this over on the machine and use some light hammer taps on the compound until I'm spot on those measurements. Just like that. Now let's make some cuts. To find the edge of the part, I'll sweep the compound back and forth while slowly bringing in the z-axis closer to the part. Once I get a touch on that corner, I'll zero the DRO. Then start working my way in on the z-axis while taking several small passes using the compound hand wheel. There's no power feed on this compound axis, so it takes a little practice to find the right feed rate. The DRO is light years more accurate than my eyeball on a scale, but it never hurts to do a sanity check. One last detail before parting this off is to work a small radius on the top side to match the existing tool post. Oh, and of course we can't move on without sanding a nice finish on here. Then that's everything we can do on this side of the part. I'll cut this off about 20 thou long to leave just enough for a finishing pass on the opposite side. The only area left to really grab onto this is with a small sliver on the finished OD. So I'll set this up in the three jaw chalk with aluminum guards to protect the surface. It's pretty important that this face end up perpendicular to the center axis so that the nut applies pressure evenly. I'll chew it up with a dial indicator running along the face we just parted off, which we know is already square. Then I can get a touch, take a shallow pass, measure one last time, and take the final pass to dimension. And naturally, I'll put a little chamfer on the threaded bore and the outside diameter. And that's it for the lathe work. Let's move over to the mill and cut the wrench flats. As I said before, the wrench flats aren't strictly necessary for this part, but they are my backup just in case I'm not able to adequately tighten the nut with the lever. The first flat can go anywhere around the perimeter, so I'll just pick a spot to clamp. To locate the part, I'll use a drill chuck with an edge finder on the back edge of the part, and then zero the DRO. Then I'll move over and swap the chuck for an end mill. Man, I don't know how I ever lived without the quill impact. To set the width of the wrench flat, I'm using the known diameter of the part. I'll get a touch on this with the end mill mounted, and then I'll zero the quill micrometer. Yet another feature I have no idea how I lived without. After adjusting the y-axis, I can start taking incremental cuts to form the flat. For each of these, I'm bringing the quill down about an eighth of an inch at a time on the micrometer. To ensure the opposite wrench flat is cut parallel to the first, I'm resting the first flat on a parallel in the vise. Then I can just repeat the same process for the second wrench flat. If you couldn't tell by my fountain of expletives, this is where I realized my big dummy mistake. The flats I just milled, they needed to be in a specific orientation to ensure that the handle doesn't end up in some stupid location. If I swap the tool post nut for the one I'm making and just tighten it in place with the wrench, you can see the problem. Well, maybe it's not that big of a problem. The machine shop gods have graced me once again. What I was going to say is that once this is tightened, the handle I'll be adding might have ended up in some odd orientation, like hanging over the work or pointed back at the operator. But it looks like I got lucky, and the handle is already pretty close to where the existing tool change handle is. I would like that handle to go a little further though, about 20 degrees, so it's more in line with the other handle in its resting position. 
Fortunately, this is a small adjustment I can achieve by shaving a little more off the bottom face. This will, in effect, let the nut rotate just a bit more, putting it in a more ideal location once tightened. Yes, that's more like it. Now let's mark this face as the one that gets a handle before I make any more stupid mistakes. Back on the mill, I need to set this part up at a 20 degree angle to make the hole for the handle. This definitely isn't the most accurate setup, and if the orientation of this feature were more critical, I would be more methodical about this. But it's just a handle I'm mounting, so this will be just fine. To locate the part, I'll get a touch on one of the 1, 2, 3 blocks to find the center. And then also on the bottom edge. Yeah, I know, what about the chamfer? Remember, it's just a handle. After center drilling for the hole, I'll switch to an end mill and spot face down past this radius. This will give the shoulder of the handle a good surface to seat against. Then we can pre-drill for the M14 by 2 mm tap we ordered specifically for this project. Actually, you may find this hard to believe, but this is the first time I've actually gotten to use this tap wrench since making it several months ago. Yep, that's just as good as I was expecting it to be. Alright, let's see how this handle fits. Mostly good, except for one small problem. The end of the handle threads protrudes into the center bore a bit. But a quick lick on the belt grinder should take care of this. Let's thread this handle back in and see how it fits on the lathe. The approach is smooth. Gaining speed. Nailed it. The orientation is perfect. And that change we made to the handle angle looks like it worked out great. Plenty of finger clearance. Now there's just one last thing to address. The finish. Right now there are just too many different colors going on here. So let's break this down and give this part a nice black oxide finish. Now this thing is ready for final assembly. Well doesn't that look handsome? I'd even venture to say that it looks original to the machine, which is just what I was hoping for. It also feels very sturdy, so I have no worries I'll break something when I have to gronk down on this. Despite having multiple mishaps on this relatively simple project, I'd still call it a success. I learned how to not use some of the features on the lathe, got to try some new techniques, and even expanded my fixturing repertoire a little bit, even if it was a bit questionable. And in the end, I've made the lathe just a little bit nicer to use. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Thank you.